Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines, where my very special guest is our United States Senator, David Vitter. He's running for governor of the great state of Louisiana. He's going to talk to us about the number one issue from listening and learning from folks, jobs. He's also going to tell us the most immediate issue is getting this budget stabilized, but the long-term issue is making sure our people are being educated for the jobs we have here. So join us on the next Legal Lines with United States Senator David Vitter. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where we're going to talk about the law and you and why it should matter to you what a law is. You know, in America, in our cities, in our states, in our federal governments, they all pass thousands, hundreds of thousands of laws, regulations every single year, and they either directly or indirectly affect you. That's why you need to know what a law is. It's an exercise of power over people, places, and things. So join us on the next Legal Lines where knowledge is power. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, so great to have you back on Thank the you, show. Thank you, Locke. Great to be here. Well, you know, uh, last time we met, you said you, you were running for governor, that you were going to listen, learn, and then lead. And that was a, about a year ago. I assume you've listened, you've learned, and now you're ready to lead. So how are you going to do that? Well, we've been doing all of that. We started well over a year ago, over a year and a half ago really uh, reaching out to folks all around the state. We had a series of leadership forums. Each one was about 25 key leaders and experts from around the state on one key topic at a time. Those were really, really helpful to me. I did listen a lot. I did learn a lot. We did a lot of follow-up. And then over time, we began to compile these solutions and ideas on all of these key challenges in a plan. And that's really now the centerpiece of our campaign. It's called Together, Louisiana Strong. And, and I was telling you, yeah, I, I've absolutely. actually read it, and it's Good. available on your website, right? Yes, it's at davidvitter.com. And I'm impressed if you have read every word. You're probably I really have. I've read you're probably every in a club word. of about five people. Well, it's, <laughs> you it's, and me are two of them. But I'd love detailed. for folks. Yeah, it is. And I'd love for folks to go to davidvitter.com. Don't have to read the whole thing, but go to whatever topic you're most interested in. When it has 14 um, chapters, right? Right. right. 14 uh, education areas of focus. Or higher ed or infrastructure, which is crucial in Baton Rouge with all of our traffic congestion problems, uh, creating jobs and a skilled workforce to fill them. So a lot of details, I'd, uh, detailed ideas there. You know, it's interesting. We, we've done several shows, and currently you're a United States Senator. You were elected in 2004, I believe. Uh, you've, you've been involved in the judiciary as an attorney. You were also in the state legislature, in the House, in the Senate, um, involved in term limits there. You've indicated if you're elected governor, you're not going to run for any other political no, office. This, you won't this, be appointed anything. No, this, this is it. This is it. This will be, knock on wood, um, my last political job, elected or appointed, period, no matter what. I said that the day I announced my intention to run, and that's going to be it. And uh, that's to say, I'm going to get up every day and be a thousand per percent focused on Louisiana, all of Louisiana, from our best and brightest to our most vulnerable. Because you really, um, by doing so, you kind of take politics out of the mix yeah, in a lot yeah, of ways. You're yeah. not trying and to get something down the road no, the way no. some folks and, seem and look, to. And look, obviously, that's what a lot of people are concerned with Governor Jindal about. Uh, that's not going to be a concern here because this is going to be it for me. I'll put it another way. You know, Wendy and I both grew up here. We've lived all of our lives here except for, for some college out of state. Uh, we're going to live the rest of our days here. And our motivation at the end of the day is pretty simple, same as yours and most people's. Right. We want to live the rest of our days surrounded by our kids and eventually our, right. our grandkids. We want them to be able to f fulfill their dreams right here in Louisiana, to have the exciting careers and the quality of life and the great opportunities and environment for their families right here next to us. David, when I was reading your plan, I kind of was organized it in my head and I said, what this boils down to is, is the way that if you're elected governor, you intend to keep the promise of our forefathers, which sounds hokey, but it's the pursuit of life, liberty, Absolutely. and the pursuit of happiness. Absolutely. And this and, is a 14-chapter plan on how yeah. you plan to do and, that. And, you know, our forefathers really meant for the states to have right. a leadership role in that. You know, it wasn't just one national government. That's right. It was a collection of states in a meaningful way. Obviously, the federal government 
needs to do some really important things. But they intended for the states to be laboratories of democracy and to have a lot more control than we do right now, quite right. frankly, over a number of areas. It seems it's been turned upside yep. on its head. Instead yep. of the people having the power yep. and they give it to the states and then the states and people give it yep. to the federal government, we're lucky to yep. send money back to, to Washington and get it back without any strings. Absolutely. It never happens. Yeah. Right? Well, I'll be an aggressive governor fighting for that, demanding that, working with other governors to make that happen and building right here what hopefully will be a really positive, impressive model for conservative constitutional governance. Well, you, you're, you're being very uh, humble when you say I went to school out of state because I've said this before. It's remarkable that we have a shot at, at having you elected governor and currently representing us in the Senate. You are extraordinarily gifted with a lot of gray matter, so good brains. Well, you, you, you graduated you from Tulane, Harvard, went to Oxford, uh, Rhodes Scholar, degrees high with all honors in e economics and the law. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, probably the most important thing at the end of the day, though, and I, and I had great experiences in all of those places, is basically Louisiana common sense, because you got to ground that in the right values and That's the right, right sort of perspective and common sense. And certainly, as I travel the state and I go to every parish, I have town halls and all sorts of other forums, um, that's what, what, what I learn from a lot of folks from all around the state. What are your guiding principles? When push comes to mm -hmm. shove, and it's a really difficult decision to make, what do you turn to? Well, look, I think uh, same thing most Louisianians turn to. We're rooted in family. We're extremely rooted in family. We get that that is the basis of our lives and that has to remain so. That's an important structure. Uh, number two, certainly religious faith. I mean, that's unique and different for a lot of different people. I happen to be Roman Catholic, but most Louisianans share a deep religious faith and grounding in that. That's right. And then in terms of uh, government and politics, um, uh, the role of the individual of liberty and freedom. Now, you need government. Government needs to do some important things. Government, in some cases, needs to corral us or organize us in certain ways. But it doesn't have to go beyond that in a way that limits the, the freedom and the opportunities for the individual. In fact, we've discussed before, as I understand your philosophy of government, it's maximum individual freedom yeah. with maximum personal responsibility sure. with as limited government as is possible. Sure. And you said it earlier, with the power vested in the people in the states, right. federal government's sure. minimized. And government is best that's closest to the people. That's right. So you should try to do things locally. You know, only when you can't should you have to go to the state level. Only when you can't deal there should you have to go to the federal level. And in some cases, you have to. I mean, national defense, right. interstate highways, right. other things. But that should be the presumption instead of, unfortunately, a lot of folks in Washington have turned that well, upside it's down. It's actually written in our Constitution, yeah, but absolutely. our courts, it seems yeah. to me, and we've talked about too much power is now yeah. vested in too few people, yeah. whether it's the president, the, the yeah. leaders of the parties in Congress, and now five out of nine Supreme yeah. Court justices. Correct. I think you also see that in one issue area in particular, and that's education. Um, right. you know, and we need to turn that upside down. We need to put as the highest rank parents and teachers, not the federal government, not federal bureaucrats, not even state government or state bureaucrats, but let's start where it should always start, parents and teachers and then school-based leaders, uh, and then uh, go from there. But, uh, but too often, uh, particularly the federal government tries to turn that upside down. And so folks, you, you've listened and you've learned, their number one issues are what, David? Well, some big issues, uh, the budget mess, and that impacts a lot of other things. And that's like, immediate. Oh yes, that's the most immediate, like higher ed, infrastructure, traffic congestion in Baton Rouge, horrible problem skills training to help get so our education. All right, we'll, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Legal Lines with Locke Meredith and my very special guest, our United States Senator David Vitter, running for governor. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where we're going to talk about the law and you and why it should matter to you what a law is. You know, in America, in our cities, in our states, in our federal governments, they all pass thousands, hundreds of thousands of laws regulations every single year and they either directly or indirectly affect you. That's why you need to know what a law is. It's an exercise of power over people, places, and things. So join us on the next Legal Lines where knowledge is power. 
Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, very special guest today, our United States Senator, David Bitter. David, let's dive right back sure. here. All right, so you've met with these folks. You've heard their, their key issues. Jobs is, is one of them. Absolutely. Tell us how we fix this issue. Yeah, well, a big piece of it is, is skills training, giving Louisianians the skill sets they need to get the good jobs that are out there. Compared to a lot of places, we have good jobs available, but a lot of folks don't have the skill sets to walk into them. In fact, Locke, if you look at two Louisiana lists right now, one list is uh, un unfilled, good-paying jobs. Second list is the unemployment list. The jobs list is actually longer than the unemployment Holy list. Holy moly. Uh, the problem is the gap between them, and so we need to focus on those unemployed folks, make sure they have opportunities to get the skill sets they need. Uh, and that also has to start with our younger people, including educating kids and families about what's out there, good paying jobs that sometimes don't take four years of college. Right. You know, most studies will tell us that 70% or more of the new jobs we'll see for the foreseeable future certainly take more than a high school education, okay. but take less than a four-year college education. And I hate to say this, some, yeah. sometimes I say it though, it yeah. feels like the first two years of college these days really yeah. not teaching you much of yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. And the last two do, and yeah. it makes sense then. Yeah. And so we need to make sure kids understand those opportunities. College should be available to everybody in America, no right. matter what your race or background or economic status. But college isn't for everybody. And particularly in Louisiana, you can have a great life and a great lifestyle and a great career with the right skill set. Well, and as a state, we're so blessed with having minerals oh, yeah. and land located yeah. in a perfect location. Yeah. And, and we river. have waterways, yeah. the Mississippi River yeah. and our Gulf. Yeah. And so we have these, these natural resources yeah. that we've been given by God. And so you got to take the, these jobs that are being created by those, those resources. Absolutely. So how do you create the infrastructure to access those particular resources of the state? Well, you, you hit on a second word, which is key infrastructure. Um, we need to catch up in terms of roads and bridges, dredging, ports. Uh, we're lagging behind, and that is becoming a bottleneck to job growth. I guess pun intended, right. a bottleneck. Uh, that, if you think about it, if, if the economy is the body, that's sort of the backbone. And you need that skeleton of real infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges, ports, waterways that are properly- For transportation. Uh, properly dredged. Uh, for that body to really prosper. And so we need to do a better job there. We're way behind. Needs to start with properly spending the transportation trust fund. We have a state so-called trust fund, but last year only 11 cents of every dollar of that revenue how actually is, went to road and bridge construction. How is that possible? It's been raided. It's become a piggy bank to raid to plug other holes in the budget, we need to stop that. And so that's probably millions of dollars of okay. gasoline taxes yep. and such that go in there, Absolutely. and yet it's not being spent yeah. on the infrastructure we need yeah. to bring in employers. 11 cents on the dollar last year, that's ridiculous. That should be the huge majority, should be over 90 cents. So how do you fix that? Well, we stabilize the budget uh, overall uh, and, and push those other things out of the Transportation Trust Fund and really protect and preserve that so-called trust fund, make it a true trust fund for infrastructure. I know you, we're talking about the infrastructure, and we talked about making sure that, in essence, the arteries of, the, yeah. of our state's bodies working yeah. so transportation can take place. Yeah. And you were talking about education. We yeah. literally have the jobs that people yeah. need, yeah. but they don't have the skills. Right. I, I, we've talked about this before, but education from pre-kindergarten all the way yeah. up to your graduate courses, sure. How do you uh, streamline that? Streamline it, make it better. Yeah, well, uh, several things in our education chapter. One is uh, I'm against Common Core. I think we should get out of that umbrella. We Amen. need standards. We Federal need control rigor. again. Yeah, we need standards and rigor and accountability. We don't need it controlled from outside the state. We don't need to give the feds and and uh, national sort of elites more control. Uh, also, I think parts of Common Core are developmentally inappropriate, so we need to change that. So that's step one. That would also be getting out of the park test while maintaining standards, rigor, and accountability. I'd focus really like a laser beam on early years, early grades, and basic skills like reading. Good. Nationally, the percentage of our incoming fourth graders who read at an adequate 
incoming fourth grade level is 34%. So that means two thirds down, two thirds are already lagging. But if you think that's bad, holy moly! If you think that's bad in Louisiana, the percentage isn't 34%; it's 23%. So over so three that, quarters are lagging. Now, like it doesn't one matter. out of four kids. Yeah, yeah. Less than one out of four are adequate in reading. That means more than three out of four are behind. Now, like it doesn't matter what test you're given in the eighth grade, if the that's kid right. isn't reading properly or or with, well, with full success in the third and fourth grade. So as a third and fourth grade, yeah. they're already set on a path yeah. where they cannot succeed. Yeah. They'll and never we, have the skills necessary. We've got to change that in the early years and the early grades, basic skills like reading. Another part of that is discipline. Every good producing school you go to has a disciplined environment. Every good successful school you visit also has a great on-site leader usually the principal. And those are key ingredients and we need to focus and make sure those ingredients are there. And I believe you support competition between yes. the schools yes. and, and that, that manifests itself how? Yes, well, charter schools, voucher scholarships, and basically that's mostly about empowering parents. That's right. Giving them choice and empowering them. If you put them in charge, involve them more, good things are gonna happen. So in essence, you're giving them the money. The better right. You give them the money and they get to go to the school that's providing that good learning right. environment. Absolutely. The kids know how to read. Yep. Yep. Excellent. What about higher education? I know every yeah. year it seems like we're a yeah. billion dollars short yeah. and they're getting yeah. cut. Well, higher ed has gotten cut and cut and cut. So first thing we need to do is attack the budget mess. So we stop death by a thousand cuts. So it's the disease education. and those are the symptoms. Yep. Raiding yep. the trust fund, taking money yep. out of higher ed. So that all goes to an early special session, I would call right off the bat. Okay. Focus on the budget, really go after the fundamentals, spending reform, tax reform. That's the first thing we would take on in a, in a very, very early special session. Now, we also talked about uh, not requiring the four-year higher education completely right. through it. Right. And I think that you've mentioned in the past coordinating uh, the needs of the employers with right. specific skill training. Explain yeah. that. Well, we're in balance. We're too four-year heavy. We're too two-year skills training light, and we need to correct that over time. That doesn't have to mean closing campuses on the four-year end. It does mean uh, correcting that over time and building up skills training and two-year programs. You can also co-locate co a lot of those, share campus facilities, share other facilities, we need to be more nimble and efficient in that way as well. So they share resources yep. in essence. Absolutely. And all right, excellent. And so, are, is there coordination of what the business world needs uh, with the, yeah, the we've educational world? Yeah, we've actually gotten world? better at that in the Votech community and system, but we can get better still. You know, you go back 20 years, and there was a big gulf between the Votech system and actual employers. We need now, to integrate that more. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Locked Mayor with Legal Lines. My special guest, our United States Senator David Vitter, running for governor. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where we're going to talk about you and the law. You know, a law is nothing but an exercise of power over you, people, places, or things. But where does that power come from? Where does the government get that power? And how is that power exercised? And do you play a role at all? That's what you need to know. So join us on the next Legal Lines where knowledge is power. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith again. Pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. He's running for governor and he tells us today what he's going to do if he's elected governor. Let's talk about the budget. Number Absolutely. one issue. Yeah. Every year we seem like we're a yeah. billion short. Yeah. What do we do? Well, it's our most immediate challenge, uh, maybe not our most important long term, I think that's education, but the most immediate. That's why I said months ago I would immediately call a special legislative session focused exclusively on stabilizing the budget through really fundamental spending reform and tax reform. Again, the details are all in our plan together, Louisiana Strong, okay. that's at davidbitter.com. On the spending side, like the biggest thing we need to do is actually undedicate, create more flexibility in a lot of spending areas that are off limits now. That's the single biggest reason higher ed has always gotten disproportionate cuts. It's not protected, and so many other things that are often less important are protected. 
So we need to even that playing field. On the tax side, we need to look at all of our state credits and exemptions and deductions and see what really produces for the taxpayer and what does not. Some are justified, some grow the economy, others are really giveaway or spending programs by another name. David, explain to folks on the spending side of yeah. this equation, this formula. Yeah. You talked about dedicated. Yeah. Most folks don't understand yeah. really well, that, what that, that means. That just means whole areas of spending that are protected, that are off limits Y'all can't touch from it. examination and cuts. And they're protected in a number of different ways. Probably the strongest protection would be if it's constitutionally protected, but there are other ways as well. What that means is if you have a down economy and you need to cut parts of the budget, you know, if 80% is off limits, that means the 20% that remains on the table like higher ed really gets that's, whacked. That's where they get hit. Yeah. And isn't that about the formula? 80% yep. is dedicated and you yep. can't touch it and you yep. can't mess with yep. it and the 20% are yep. the, the guys that get raised. So we need to raised. peel away those protections and then get in the weeds and do away with stuff we simply can't afford. So how, how is that accomplished? Because, because you mentioned it, a lot of yeah. it's in the Constitution. Some of it's constitutional, some of it's statutory. It'll be a number of different changes that we would propose uh, in that early special session. And the Constitution stuff, I guess, would have to go to the vote of the people. Correct. They get, they, Correct. They're get they involved in the process Correct. like it should be. So those uh, uh, changes would take a two-thirds vote of both the House and the Senate and then a vote of the people. Okay, excellent. And then on the tax side, you were talking about uh, as I understand it, we, we give credits or we provide yeah. money to folks, credits well, we against taxes or we, we, from taxation. We, we exempt $8 billion of stuff from our tax code. Now, some of that is for good reason, but others uh, are, are giveaways. We exempt Mardi Gras beads. <laughs> I really? That. I mean, we, you know, we exempt uh, all sorts of things. We need to go through that and broaden the tax base. The broader the base, the lower your rates can be. The broader the base, the fairer it is. So we need to broaden the base and lessen some of those credits and exemptions and deductions. And by broadening the base, what we're saying is more people are paying right. taxes. Yep. So yep. if everybody's paying taxes, right. people yep. who were paying don't have yep. to pay as much. Right. Absolutely. Eight billion dollars. So the, the gamble or the hope is, is we're gonna leave eight billion dollars in these people or these companies' hands and they're gonna but what? In, in terms Create of jobs? In, in terms of stuff in the economy, we exempt more stuff than we actually tax. Now again, some of that is justified, but a lot of it isn't, and we need to revisit that. And so in the revisiting is basically looking at every one of those yeah, sure. on an item by item basis sure. and saying, are we getting our money's worth yeah. in essence? And again, some of those are good incentives right. that produce for the economy and the taxpayer. Others are really giveaways or spending programs by another name. I'll give you an example, the solar panel tax credit. First of all, it's a refundable credit. So that means it's, you don't have to pay taxes to get the credit. It could be a check from the taxpayer. Wow, I you didn't know you, that. You don't, you don't have to have any tax Good liability. Gosh. Refundable means it's a check. Secondly, it's a big check. It's not $100, it's not $200. It's ten thousand dollars. It's fifteen thousand. Right. Third, it's a big check, usually to people like you and me who are perfectly well off. Now, I would suggest when we have crumbling roads and bridges, <laughs> and cut after cut after Agreed. cut to higher ed, we shouldn't be in that business. And it's basically propping up the solar business, yeah. which you kind of wonder how many jobs is right. this providing? Right. Inter interesting. In fact, I remember seeing advertising about that. Gover federal government's providing tax oh, credits yeah. and the state's providing yeah. tax credits. R remarkable. Right. So what other type of items are you looking at specifically that are kind of on your, you're yeah. going to take them out? Well, uh, John Kennedy has come up with some great ideas. He's pointing out that we have billions of dollars. Great state treasure. Consult yes, consulting contracts that we need to revisit. Some of those are unnecessary. Also, some of it is basically work that we're farming out of state government that we have state employees supposed to be doing. Right. So, look, let's put it one place or the other, but let's not pay for both. There are also some pet projects uh, and, and spending items that are in every budget. We just need to go through that with a fine tooth comb. Let's talk about the, the chapter that talked about you want government to be honest and efficient and effective and consumer oriented. Yeah. Customer, Meaning us. Customer focus. When's the last time you went into any government offices, federal, state, local, doesn't matter, and felt like you were being treated like a valued customer? 
Doesn't happen. Not so much. Does not happen much. And that needs to be the culture in all of those offices. Uh, that's not the feeling you get at uh, Office of Motor Vehicles, not to pick on them, or when you deal with uh, the, the tax department. And that should be the impression you get. So I'm, I'm kind of viewing the, the whole big government thing. In, a, in essence, what you're saying is we need to make government more efficient and yeah. more effective. Yeah. And part of that is using the resources we have, not increasing taxes, but yeah. spending the money wisely. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, uh, based on the discussion we've heard in the legislature the last six months, you would think to some extent, we don't have any spending problem. It's all on the tax side. That's ridiculous. Right. Now it's both places, uh, and I also disagree with Governor Jindal that somehow we can't touch any of these exemptions or credits on the tax side, but we also have spending issues and budget issues we need to get real about. What about the, the I've, I've read a part of the plan, it talked about cronyism. Just yeah. the capitalism yeah. has been perverted where yeah. if you know the right people and, and do the right thing, yeah. somehow you're going to benefit. Well, in Locke and Louisiana, I think it's the intersection of two things. First of all, we have had a political past of corruption right. and cronyism, you know, sort of the old Huey Long politics. And now we have this growth of corporate cronyism, That's right. including at the federal level. Um, I'm very concerned about both of those traditions and want to end both of those trends. And so how do you implement something like that? Well, by have a, having a zero tolerance policy against it, by enacting uh, reforms in terms of state government and state politics, doing away with double dipping that you've seen in terms of how some folks abuse their, their campaign accounts and, and other things like that, you know, legislators using campaign funds for golf club memberships. Right. I mean, that's And, and football tickets, yeah. I remember reading. Right. Season tickets. I mean, you know, if you're taking certain people to one game, maybe for a fundraiser, I understand the rationale for that. But season tickets, a golf club membership, and there are certain things we just Agreed. need to cut out. David, we're going to continue this on the next yep. show. This is Lock Mayor with Legal Lines. My very special guest, our United States Senator David Vitter running for governor. We're going to do another show. Thank you for joining us.